We are continuing History of the Churches, Churches in Modern Times, and last week we started on the subject of the fundamentalist movement, Fund fundamentalist movement, uh, and uh, particularly in the uh, 1800s, into the early 1900s, or actually throughout the 1900s, but particularly the early, uh, the, the later 1800s into the 1900s. Uh, it, uh, where we left off, we kind of left off in the middle of a slide, and we covered the, uh, the fact that the fundamentalist movement resulted in more teaching on the imminent return of Christ and a literal interpretation of Bible prophecy. So there was a, uh, an upsurge, an upswelling of interest in teaching on that, which uh, in a lot of ways still goes on today, although uh, I'd say there's more and more uh, of uh, influences out there of a less literal interpretation of Bible prophecy, but one of the good fruits of the fundamentalist movement was a focus on those things, the imminent return of Christ and the literal interpretation of Bible prophecy. As I said last week, William Nicholson preached a message at the 1878 meeting, uh, at, at, a, at a meeting there, at a conference, he preached a, a message called The Gathering of Israel. Now that was 1878, not 1948, when Israel was officially uh, uh, became a nation, politically speaking, um, uh, as far as the country of Israel, the state of Israel, I should say. And, uh, but in 1878, so there was, uh, I think we might have left off here, um, that uh, there was a lot of influence from Bible-believing people upon uh, even the government. Uh, one, one particular leader in, you could say, the fundamentalist movement, and particularly independent Baptist uh, church is, um, uh, was J. Frank Norris, and J. Frank Norris wrote a letter to the president at the time when there was, uh, is America going to recognize the state of Israel? And J. Frank Norris wrote a letter to the president uh, of the United States and uh, was, was influencing him toward the recognition of Israel. So, uh, so that is a good fruit of the uh, fundamentalist movement. Uh, another thing that, uh, some other things that it focused on, uh, holy Christian living, evangelistic and missionary zeal, the use of technology. In other words, uh, when it came to technology, uh, they used the radio quite heavily. Um, that was their technology at that time, the, the latest and greatest. Um, and then uh, hymn singing and the founding of Bible Institutes. Now, a couple of the uh, I wanted to focus on a couple of the hymns here, or a couple of the uh, hymn composers here. Um, if I can find my spot here in this book, uh, as I said last week, um, basing these on the history and heritage of fundamentalism and fundamental Baptist by David Cloud. And I'm going to try to find that uh, section on hymns. Where might it be? Oh, right use of technology, there we go. Bible Institutes, there we go. Where'd the hymns? The hymns disappeared. Oh, there it is, hymn singing. Um, all right, so we had um, the Second Great Awakening was a hymn singing movement. Now, this would have been before, uh, really, you could have said fundamentalism, uh, the movement of fundamentalism got going. But in the history here of the, uh, of, of the Great Awakenings, of the... Um, uh, to the fundamental uh, movement, uh, hymn singing was a big part in that. Uh, as it says here, the hymn, uh, Second Great Awakening was a hymn singing movement. It is said to have lasted from 1790, following the establishment of America as a nation, to about 1840. It occurred as the American nation spread westward and its population increased dramatically from 5 million in 1800 to 31 million to, in 1860. The closing years of the 18th century found America in deep spiritual decline, but many were praying, and God sent revivals that swept across all parts of the nations. Um, uh, it talks about the Methodist churches increased, and by, the Methodist churches of that time were different than the Methodist churches of today. Not necessarily they weren't always completely, they weren't completely doctrinally correct, but they definitely had a bigger uh, emphasis on holy living uh, and... and um, Godliness, uh, separation. Uh, some of the well-known hymns written during the Second Great Awakening were the following. Uh, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord, by Timothy Dwight. That was in 1801. Holy, 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 by Reginald Heber, 1826. Uh, also from Heber was from Greenland's Icy Mountains in 1829. Rock of Ages, 
1830, my faith looks up to thee, 1830, I worship the king, 1833, my hope is built on nothing less, 1834, uh, just as I am, 1845, what wondrous love is this, 1835, Savior like a shepherd lead us, 1836, come Christians join to sing, 1843, come ye thankful people come, uh, 1844, sweet hour prayer, 1845, Blessed be the tie that binds, 1845, Fairest Lord Jesus, 1850, um, Crowned with Many Crowns, 1851, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, 1855. And so there was uh, an emphasis on uh, the hymn singing. So these hymns had been written before really the fundamentalist movement got m moving. Uh, and so kind of at the beginning of that, at, at through the great, Second Great Awakening, up through the beginning of the fundamentalist movement, revivalist movement, and um, there were some uh, influential hymn writers during the revivalist slash fundamentalist movement of the second half of the 19th century, and they included Philip Bliss, Fanny Crosby, Ira Sankey, Francis Havergal, uh, Charles Gabriel, Daniel Whittle, Charles Converse, Robert Lowry, Homer Roadheaver, and James McGrannan. And uh, then William Kirkpatrick, William Bradbury, William Doan, and George Stebbins wrote the tune to many of the popular hymns. And, um, and so there's a section here on uh, Fanny Crosby, um, and then also Philip Bliss. Uh, he, wrote, um, he wrote many, he wrote many uh, very solid uh, hymns as well. And so many, many hymns that were written during that era, and we actually have a, there's a long list here from about... 1855 down to 1938, a very substantial list of hymns. And so it was during this period that many of the hymns that are in our hymnal were written. There are a few that go back that are older, uh, but uh, there are quite a substantial number that were written during this time period, either during the Great Awakening period or the Revival uh, Fundamentalist uh, era. And uh, so very much a focus on hymn singing. And then also the founding of Bible Institutes. That was a very, uh, uh, a very big emphasis. Uh, for example, the New York Missionary Training Institute was founded by A.B. Simpson. The Bible Institute for Home and Foreign Missions was founded by D.L. Moody. It was later renamed Moody Bible Institute. The Boston Missionary Training School was founded by A.J. Gordon, later renamed Gordon Bible College. Boone Biblical College in Boone, Iowa was founded by J.C. Crawford. Golden Valley Institute was founded by R.A. Forrest in Golden Valley, North Carolina, later moved to Tocoa, Georgia, and renamed Tocoa Falls Institute. Uh, Biola, uh, Biblical Institute of Los Angeles, was founded with funding from oil magnate Lyman Stewart. R.A. Torrey was the dean of that from 1912 to 1924. The Philadelphia School of the Bible was founded by C.I. Schofield and William Pettengill. Uh, Louis Sperry Schaefer wrote much of the curriculum and in 1951 became Philadelphia Bible Institute, Philadelphia Biblical University in 2000, and Karn, Karn University in 2012. And by the way, these, just because these were started by fundamentalists, uh, that is not, does not mean they are fundamental today. Many of them are not if they are in existence. Uh, I, so, so my reading this list is not a current endorsement of any of these uh, of schools if they exist in one form or another. The o Omaha Bible Institute, which changed to Omaha Baptist Bible Institute under the leadership of John Patton, pastor of Grace Baptist Church in Omaha. Uh, it was approved by the GARBC, that's the regular Baptists, in 1956, became the Omaha Baptist Bible College in 1960, relocated to Ankeny, Iowa in 1967, was renamed the Faith Baptist Bible College, and later a seminary was added. Um, Prairie Bible Institute in Alberta, uh, Winnipeg Bible Training School in Manitoba. It was renamed Providence College and Theological Seminary. Uh, Bob Jones College started in Florida and then moved to Tennessee uh, and, and, and then South Carolina where it was called Bob Jones University. Uh, the fundamental Baptist movement resulted in many Bible colleges in the 1940s and beyond. Um, so as you got into the 1940s, 1950s, Fundamentalism itself as an interdenominational movement was waning, uh, and it became more of a Baptist movement. Uh, and once again, those colleges, I don't, I don't, uh, I, I don't as far as various reasons, I don't uh, endorse Bob Jones University, I don't endorse Biola, there's, there's, so I'm not, there's not an endorsement. If you want to know what colleges I would 
recommend. You can ask me later, but not, <laughs> I'm just reading the list of what was started at that time as part of the fundamentalist uh, movement. Um, the uh, Niagara Bible Conference of 1878 published a list of fundamental doctrines, fundamental doctrines. So the, the first one uh, that uh, they, they, they said, all right, now, now, if you weren't here last week, just to kind of recap on why this even got started in the first place, the whole fundamentalist movement was that there, were, there was an interjection of, uh, and, and a move toward more of the theological liberalism, modernism, uh, secular philosophies, uh, psychology, the, 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 and even the denial of the deity of Christ and the denial of God's inspired word. Uh, there were these, these, these doctrines, these teachings that were infiltrating many of these mainline, uh, if you, I guess you could say the Protestant churches of the day. And so there were people who, who were in the midst of those different churches, those different denominations, and they said, no, wait a minute, we need to push back against this somehow. Uh, theistic evolution being one of them, or just even evolution itself getting a foothold in uh, the churches. And so, so they said, we need to push back against this. Uh, against this modernism again. So let's, let's unite and let's, let's rally around the fundamentals of the faith. And so at this Niagara Bible Conference of 1878, they published a list of fundamental doctrines. The first one was the verbal plenary inspiration of the scriptures. Uh, second would be the Trinity. Uh, number three, the creation, fall, and depravity. Uh, and number four, the universal transmission of spiritual death from Adam. Um, Number five, necessity of the new birth. Number six, redemption only by faith in Christ and a substitutionary atonement. Uh, the, number seven, salvation by faith alone without works. Number eight, the assurance of salvation in Christ. Number nine, the centrality of Jesus Christ in the scriptures. Number 10, the constitution of the church um, composed of all genuine believers. Eleven, the personality of the Holy Spirit. Number 12, the believer's call to a holy life. Number 13, souls going to heaven or hell at death. And number 14, the premillennial second coming of Christ. And by the way, the, the section, that section on the church, and I've preached about the church here today, but I mean, here in the, I've preached about the church here in this church. Um, so uh, that is a, they, they, they retained the, uh, the doctrine of the universal church uh, as opposed to an emphasis on the local church. I'm believing the Bible, the word church means a called out assembly. Um, and yes, all genuine believers will be assembled in heaven. But um, so just to, to mention that uh, note. Um, so anyway, th that was the list that they came up with at that particular conference. And that was the foundation of the fundamentalist movement. Now, we're not going to, I don't think we're going to have time to get in this today. And actually, I'm, I know we're not going to have time to get in this today, but probably next week we'll be seeing some of the things that were omitted from that list of fundamentals that were very important. That's one of the reasons why I don't identify just in generally speaking as a quote-unquote fundamentalist because if you're saying, well, here's, here's a list of fundamental doctrines that we're going to unite on, but then it's to the exclusion of other very important doctrines, uh, then that is something that we... Um, uh, something that we'll see is, uh, is, is contrary to Scripture. Uh, and, and we'll get into some of that today, but, um, but not the specific doctrines, just overall why interdenominational fundamentalism uh, is, is contrary to certain aspects in, in the Bible, what we see here. Uh, and so the first one is that interdenominational fundamentalism. So back at that time, they said, oh, if you're a Methodist, if you're a Presbyterian, if you're a uh, even some of the Anglicans, you know, the more conservative doctrinally Anglicans, Episcopalians, uh, they were um, Plymouth Brethren or Baptist, and they were all just here. Let's let's all band together because we got to push back against this movement of the liberalism that is taking hold in the churches. So very good, uh, very well intentioned, and certainly there was some good fruit that um, that resulted in that. Uh, but the, it is contrary to the psalmist's passion for God's Word. So let's look at some scriptures here. Psalm 119. 119. Because anytime you have something that is interdenominational, there's going to be some important doctrines that are lacking. And that, like I said, we're not getting into that today. We'll get into that next week. 
But um, in uh, Psalm 119, verse 127, Psalm 119, verses 127 and 128, the, uh, the Bible says, Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. Come on in, have a seat. We're just finishing up our Sunday school time, so welcome. Um, Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. Well, the, the interdenominational fundamentalist movement allowed for some false ways to exist within that movement. We'll get into that next week. Um, but here the psalmist is saying he's got a passion for God's word, and he's got a passion for every uh, concerning all things to be right, and he hates every false way. Uh, and the second here is that it is contrary, the interdenominational fundamentalism is contrary to the Holy Spirit's character as the spirit of truth. John 14, turn over to John 14, Gospel of John. Gospel of John. And 14 and verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of truth, not the Spirit of error. Uh, in John 15 and verse 26, John 15 and verse 26, When the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And then over in the next chapter, John 16 and verse 13. John 16 and verse 13. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Notice that. So spirit of truth, spirit of truth, spirit of truth. He will guide you into all truth. And so the, the, the nature, the character of the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And so God is not going to... Um, and while, and by the way, even things that are not completely in line with God's word, if there's some things that are lacking, there certainly can be some good fruit that comes out of it in spite of that. Uh, but there's also then some, some bad fruit that can come out of that, and I do believe that has happened in uh, the fundamentalist uh, movement. But, but the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, and he will guide you into all truth. And so it's one thing if there, there are things that are... Um, maybe inadvertently omitted. But then there's a whole other thing when, when there's a, an actual stating of, well, these are the fundamentals, these are the essentials, and then these other things, we'll just kind of leave those, we'll not, try to, we'll, we'll not be divisive on the issue, and I'll just kind of give you a hint on one of them. One of them is the issue of baptism. Baptism was not a part of that list of fundamentals of the faith. Well, wait a minute, why, how's baptism not a fundamental of the faith? Doctrine of baptism. I mean, that's a pretty big doctrine in the Bible. That's a fundamental of the faith. Should be. The other problem I have with listing a, the fundamentals by, by gathering a list of fundamentals is, well, how, who, who decides what's a fundamental or not? I mean, over time, the list of fundamentals gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Why? Because it was man that made the list of what the fundamentals were in the first place, as opposed to, like the psalmist, all of God's word, the spirit of truth, guides you into all truth. And that we value everything that God's Word says and uh, not uh, putting a list here. Well, these are the important ones and these are less important. Now, I will say certain doctrines are more or less uh, consequential. So some doctrines have greater consequence than others. You know, for example, um, whether, <clears throat> you know, whether or not, I'm trying to, trying to think here uh, of, uh, of a good example, but... Um, you know, deity of Christ. If someone doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is God, I mean, that, that's a very consequential doctrine. Or, you know, if someone believes that salvation is by works or by their baptism uh, and not by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's, a very, that's very consequential because, I mean, heaven and hell are at stake there. There are some doctrines that, that heaven and hell are not at stake, but they're, they're still, they're not as consequential regarding that, but they're still vital, important doctrines because they're in the Word of God. And uh, so the spirit of truth. 
spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit's character is a spirit of truth. Uh, it is contrary to... Um, do I want to go on? All right, we'll stop with this one. We're going to stop with this one. John 17, we'll do this one yet, because you're in John. Hopefully you're in John, the Gospel of John. And uh, John, it's contrary to Jesus' prayer in John 17. Now, what's interesting is that they will actually use Jesus' prayer here to support interdenominationalism, or interdenominational fundamentalism. Now, today, interdenominational movements are generally not called fundamentalism. They're just, they're just interdenominational. Uh, but in John chapter 17 and verse 21, uh, the Bible says, That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So you might have seen some churches use this. Even certain apostate churches use this. They'll say the phrase, that they all may be one. That they all may be one. And what does that mean to them? What that means to them is, now this is not even related to the fundamentalist movement because a lot of the churches who would use this phrase aren't even <laughs> remotely close to fundamentals of the faith. If, if, if there are fundamentals, you know, if you want to go by that list, um, some of the churches use this phrase. But what they say is that they all may be one. So every denomination, I mean anything and everything, just as long as we just unite because God wants us to be united, so we're just going to unite no matter what these people believe, whatever these churches believe, we're just all going to unite. And uh, that's, that's what the focus is, because Jesus said that they all may be one. But notice we said a few verses prior in verse 17, sanctify them. Now th this is the group, he's praying this for the people who would, for his disciples, and for those who would believe on him. So the same people he's praying for in verse 21, that's who he's praying for in verse 17. He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so true unity is around the doctrines of God's word. That's where true unity lies, that they all may be one. Why did he want them to be one? Because, yeah, if, if, if God's people are united around the truth of God's word, the world's going to know yeah, there is something to Jesus, who Jesus is. There's something about, because there's a united front in the doctrines, the truth of the Scripture. And, uh, but that's not how that is used today. Oh, we just got to unite no matter what. Let's put aside all of our differences. That has nothing to do with what Jesus was saying here. Um, because he emphasized the spirit of truth, spirit of truth, spirit of truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He will guide them into all truth. And so... Uh, so the, the interdenominational fundamentalist movement was contrary to Jesus' prayer there. Now we have a few others we're not going to get to today, but we will um, resume next week, Lord willing. Yes, Denise. Um, I'm thinking of Harvard and Yale. Okay. Um, I'm not sure when they were established, but they I believe so. I think they, they go back farther uh, because, um, uh, yes, I, I do believe they go back farther. Um, and they were, they went downhill pretty fast. They, they weren't ones, that, one of these that were um, kind of just a gradual downgrade. It didn't take long for the... And they, they were established to um, teach right. preachers. Right, right. So these preachers would go out from there and, right. and then they would go downhill. Yeah. Yeah, and Harvard, yeah, yeah, and and um, they, yeah, it, it didn't, it just didn't take long for things to permeate through there for those in those particular examples, those Ivy League schools. Um, um, it, it, it's, I would not compare them to a fundamentalist school, say something like Bob Jones, um, that was established as a fundamentalist school um, that still, in some ways, has. You, you'll get some decent teaching there, but there's some problematic doctrines. They've wholeheartedly, they're, I mean, they're yoking up with um, Presbyterians and, I mean, all kinds of ecumenical stuff going on there. Uh, and, and just then their, their viewpoint on the Bible has shifted over the years. And, but it was, you know, Bob Jones was a Methodist. He wasn't even a Baptist, although a lot of people, and this is showing the progression of how the fundamentalist movement turned from interdenominational more to Baptist because for some reason a lot of the people affiliated with Bob Jones are part of Baptist churches. Some of them are Bible churches, a lot of them Bible churches as well. 
But I'm thinking, this wasn't even established as a Baptist school. Why are there so many Baptists involved with Bob Jones? And I think it's because the fundamentalist movement shifted into more of a fundamental Baptist movement because the, the Methodists went way off, the, you know, the pres- you know the, all these different ones didn't really hold to those same thing. There's not as much, but they're, they're definitely, um, there's definitely a lot of ecumenicalism there, uh, ecumenicism there at, at Bob Jones. So I wouldn't even, so that was, but that was a gradual downgrade where they're still, I would say they're off on some doctrines and, and various things, but at the same time, they're still a Christian college, so to speak. Where th- places like Harvard and Yale, I mean, they're not I mean, even remotely uh, that anymore. And, and, it, and if you look back at their histories, it wasn't, wasn't very long. It, it didn't take long for them. Um, and that's one of the problems when you get away from the biblical pattern of the, the local church being the one to fulfill the Great Commission is it's not, it doesn't take much for these colleges to, um, to, to just go down the ones that are, are uh, just kind of they stand alone and maybe churches have a hand in them. But in, the, in some of these Bible Institutes colleges, they just, uh, a lot of them went downhill over the years. But uh, I mean, Harvard, I think it was Harvard that just uh, appointed, I think, the head of their chaplains is an atheist now. Um, so, I mean, oh, and all the chaplains, oh, yeah, we're all for this. Yeah, our chaplain's an atheist. Now, wait, wait, how's, how does that work? How do you have a chaplain who's an atheist? But, uh, but that's just it's the example of, of just how far gone uh, they were gone. But they, they were, but they were founded, I believe, much. They they would be they would predate the fundamentalist uh, movement, um, and then and like I said, just <laughs> when that <laughs> when that theological liberalism, modernism, and all that crept. I mean, they just it, they they went uh, they went pretty far downhill pretty quickly. So, all right, it's going to be it for now.